Weather in the Vertical, a presentation by Ed Williams. This presentation is brought to you by the Flying Particles Incorporated. The presentation by Ed Williams is copyright 2008 by Ed Williams, all rights reserved. The production by LBMG Music is copyright 2008 by LBMG Music, all rights reserved. Hope you enjoy this presentation of Weather in the Vertical. And now, our speaker. So this is um, uh, the first of a pair of talks that are uh, strongly related. So uh, uh, the next one will be given next month. And they're both about uh, weather in the vertical. So what's this all about? Well, in particular, why is the vertical and temperature and moisture profile of the atmosphere so important? Um, well, that's sort of a, an issue of weather theory, and in particular, the temperature profile determines the stability of the atmosphere, whether or not it's uh, stable to convection currents. And whether or not it's stable determines, to a very large extent, the kind of weather you'd expect to see. So we'll be talking today about atmospheric stability, uh, what it means, uh, how you'd... Uh, and we'll come about determining whether it was stable or not and what the characteristics of stable and unstable weather are. Next month, uh, we'll be looking, with this background, we'll be looking at how to use these vertical soundings, as they're called, the temperature and dew point profiles of the atmosphere, plotted on what are called skew t plots, to uh, augment our weather briefings. And uh, we'll show that you can use them to tell you a lot of things about uh, cloud layers, uh, cloud tops, uh, the potential for thunderstorms, potential for icing, fog, mountain waves, lots of things. And uh, although these skew T plots have been around for probably the uh, best part of a century, what has happened in the last few years is that, first of all, they're much more available to pilots because you can get them on the Internet. And secondly, there's a very nice tool that's uh, interactive, a Java-based thing, which you can click and get information from, and so you don't have to know nearly as much about actually have to use the thing uh, if you learn how to point and click. And so um, that's what we'll be talking about. So why should you be listening? Well, why, weather theory is good for you. <laughs> um, because to understand what's happening, it really does help to know why. I mean, you can just look out there and say, oh, it's a nice day, or it's not a nice day. But if you've got some some concept of why it's getting better or why it's getting worse or why the weather looks the way it is, then uh, you're less likely to be taken by surprise if the weather changes. And uh, we almost certainly don't have the skill and the knowledge of a professional meteorologist, meteorologist, but up there in the air, up there in the air flying along, we do have the advantage of being right on the spot in real time, observing the weather, and uh, we see things happening differently to the way they were forecast. If we have some understanding about how weather processes work, maybe we'll have some guess as to whether that's a bad thing or a good thing and uh, what we need to do about it. So um, the general subject in, in meteorology is called parcel theory. Parcel theory is a tool uh, that meteorologists use, forecasters in particular, to assess the possibility of vertical motion in the atmosphere. And why does vertical motion matter so much? Well, because if you take some air and you lift it, then it uh, goes to lower pressure, it expands, it cools. And if the air cools, if it's got moisture in it, then that moisture can condense. So if you add vertical motion to moisture in the atmosphere, you'll create clouds. If you cool uh, those clouds some more by lifting them some more, then uh, that moisture will condense out in the form of precipitation, rain or drizzle or snow, whatever. With sufficient vertical motion, you get clouds that uh, have extensive vertical development building up into the 10s, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50,000 feet, and uh, then, you, then you have the potential for thunderstorms. Vertical motion also affects icing. If your air is rising, then those little water droplets that condense are being lifted upwards and held up there in the atmosphere, being lifted into colder air. And if you fly along, those supercooled droplets will be larger if you've got updrafts to hold them up 
than if they're just sitting there waiting to fall. So the air's response to being lifted is determined by, what is, by its stability. And we assess this by uh, hypothetically lifting what are called parcels of air. So parcels are sort of imaginary bubbles of air. You take some lump of air and imagine you put it in saran wrap and you lift it and you lift it up and uh, you don't allow it to mix with its neighbors because you've got a nice little coating on it and you don't allow it to exchange uh, heat or, um, uh, or air with its neighbors. And you ask, what does it do? So these sort of hypothetical lumps of air are called parcels. Real lumps of air, well, when they get lifted, these other effects that I mentioned, a little bit of mixing around the edges, a um, little bit of conduction do in fact occur. So this is only an approximation to real life. It is a quite a good one. Now actual lifting, you know, why, why we even worry about air being lifted? Well, there's lots of mechanisms that can lift the air. Uh, what I've illustrated here are, are a couple of... Um, uh, common mechanisms, which, which are fronts. If you have um, a warm front in the top picture there, what we have is warm air coming in, replacing air that, you, that was cold. And that warm air being uh, less dense than the cold air will slide up on top of it. And in sliding up on top of the cold air, it'll be lifted. And that lifting will create uh, clouds and more lifting will create moisture. And so you get the weather associated with a frontal zone. Uh, the same thing happens with the reverse uh, situation of a cold front where a wedge of cold air comes in replacing warm. Uh, these cold air wedges are a little steeper and typically move a little faster, so the air gets lifted uh, more rapidly into higher altitudes. And uh, so we'll discover later that means it's more likely to be an unstable form of lifting so that those uh, clouds build to higher altitudes and perhaps give you thunderstorms in the summer. So fronts are a, a common mechanism. Uh, another one is the terrain. The technical word is orographic. So if you see orographic lifting, it means that it's being lifted by the terrain. So if you have your normal uh, west prevailing winds here, they hit the Sierras, they get lifted up. Because uh, they can't go through the mountains, they have to go over. And that lifting will create weather over the mountainous terrain that did not exist in Central Valley. So what do we mean by stability? Well. Um, the, uh, the analogy that's usually used is imagine a little marble and a dish. If you have your dish uh, uh, concave up, you put a little marble in there, and we roll it to one side, gravity will make it roll back down again, and so uh, that's said to be stable. We have an equilibrium here. If we, if we move the uh, marble away from the equilibrium position, it wants to go back again. The opposite situation is where we put the same dish, but we put it upside down, so it's <coughs> convex up. And we could very carefully balance a marble on the top. And if we don't breathe and shake the table and so forth, it'll stay there. So it's, that's an equilibrium. But it's an unstable one, just the slightest push, and the marble will roll off the top. A situation that happens in the atmosphere is uh, what is referred to as conditionally unstable. And this is where we've got something with a dent in it. And so if I give that marble a little push, only a small one, then it'll go uphill, roll back down again. But if I give it a big enough push, I'll get it over the, uh, the ridge line, and it'll fall down, and uh, it's an unstable situation. So in the context of the atmosphere, a region of the atmosphere is said to be stable if on lifting a parcel of air, its immediate tendency is to sink back down when it's released. This requires that the displaced air, this parcel you lifted up, is colder and thus denser than its surroundings after you lifted it. Um, bottom here, we've got a balloon. Uh, a balloon rises if, the, uh, if it weighs less than the air it displaces. If you uh, turn on the heater, and uh, replace some of that uh, warm air in the balloon with hotter air, then you've made the whole thing a little bit less dense, weighs less, now it'll rise. Conversely, if we uh, let out some of that hot air and replace it with cold, it uh, um, weighs more, and it'll sink back down. So just like the balloon, an air parcel will uh, rise or fall, depending on whether it weighs more or less than the air it displaces. 
which is just a function of its temperature. If it's colder than the surrounding air, it's more dense, it'll sink. If it's warmer than the surrounding air, it's less dense, and it'll rise. So you could uh, summarize that by warm air rises, <laughs> um, but it's a little bit more complicated than that because the, the atmosphere is compressible. So let's just review the fundamentals here. The air pressure is just the weight of a unit area of the air above you. So if you take a column of air that's one square inch all the way up, and you have some way of weighing it, then you discover that that uh, mass of air in that one, inch, one square inch column weighed about 14 pounds. And so the pressure of that air on the surface of this table is 14 pounds per square inch. If I move up in the atmosphere so that I have one pound of air in my column, so there's 13, 13 pounds of air above you and one, one pound below, then if I put some surface there, the weight it's supporting is now only 13 pounds, and so the pressure there is 13 pounds per square inch, etc. As you go up, you go higher and higher in altitude. Each, uh, the mass of air above is being supported by uh, the air below, uh, but the mass of air above is steadily decreasing, so the pressure is steadily decreasing. So each layer supports all the layers above, and the lower layers, because they have more pressure on them, are compressed more. So as you climb, the, uh, the pressure drops. Let's consider a parcel of air then. We lift it up, we put it in our little saran wrap baggie, we lift it up, and uh, it goes to a lower pressure, so it expands. And we know that uh, when uh, the gas expands, it cools, when you compress it, it gets hotter. You know this from pumping up your tires, you pump up your bicycle tire, the uh, valve gets hot. Conversely, let the air back out again, it cools down. So we've lifted this, uh, um, this parcel of air. It's cooler. So the, whether it will continue to rise after you've lifted it depends on whether, despite that cooling, it's warmer than its surroundings. And so that depends on how the actual temperature varies with altitude. So here I have a picture illustrating this. So on the left, we have uh, a stable atmosphere. A stable atmosphere is where the temperature decreases slowly with altitude. If I take my bottom parcel of air here, unfortunately my finger on the screen doesn't do much. Let's see. Um, if I take this parcel of air and move it up and it cools, if the temperature only decreases slowly with the altitude, then that air that I've just lifted is cool on the surrounding, so if I let go, it'll sink back, and that's stable. Conversely, on the right, I take that same parcel of air, it cools the same amount, but if the temperature decreases rapidly with altitude, then the temperature surrounding that, that parcel is colder than the bubble I just lifted. And so it's light, it's warmer than its surroundings, so it'll continue to rise. So that's an unstable situation. I lift it up a bit. And whoosh, it keeps on going. So this parcel theory, then, is a, an idealization in which the lifted air is assumed to exchange no heat or matter with the surroundings. And it's got a fancy name, which you learned in private pilot ground school. It's called an adiabatic process. And it's only imperfectly realized in nature because there is some mixing of real air parcels with the surroundings. But um, uh, it's a pretty good approximation, and it makes a tool that you can actually use. So how much are these lifted? A lifted particle expands and cools, and it expands at a, a known rate. You can measure. It's called the adiabatic lapse rate. And uh, it depends on whether the air is dry or moist. Now, dry, in, in this sense, is a term of art. Dry doesn't mean there's no, mo no moisture in it. Dry means it's not saturated with moisture. So any air that's not saturated cools at a constant rate, uh, 3 degrees Celsius for every 1,000 feet you lift it. And that's a reversible process. If I take my, uh, my parcel of air in my baggie and I lift it up 1,000 feet and stick a thermometer in it, it's uh, 
three, three degrees Celsius colder. If I bring it back down again in my airplane, descend a thousand feet, it compresses back up, and uh, it's three degrees warmer back right where it started. However, the situation is different, and this is what makes weather interesting. If this wasn't true, there wouldn't really be any weather. When uh, air is saturated, we mean 100% relative humidity, if you lift it, it expands and cools, but cooler air can't contain as much moisture, so that, that moisture condenses and releases what is called latent heat. This is the reverse of uh, if you put a kettle on the stove and you put the... Um, uh, turn on the gas, then heat it up to 100 degrees C, so now it's the same temperature as steam, but you have to keep adding heat if you actually want to boil the water off. Conversely, if you condense that steam back into water, you get the heat back. And so this, uh, this is called the latent heat, is the amount of energy it takes to break the, the liquid water up into gaseous water, or the reverse. So this cooling that... Uh, you get by expansion is offset by the latent heat. And so the moist adiabatic lapse rate, the rate at which uh, saturated air cools when you lift it, varies with the uh, moisture content, uh, which depends on the temperature. So at high temperatures, where saturated air contains a lot of moisture, cooling it condenses out a lot of moisture, gives you a lot of latent heat, and so the temperature only drops a small amount. And so at high temperatures, the, the saturated lapse rate is about one degree per thousand feet. Do you have a, a chart that would uh, show air density versus humidity? Versus, um... I don't have one right here. Um, you can find on my um, on my website a chart that will show you the, uh, the amount of water vapor as a function of temperature. It's called the saturation vapor barrier. Yeah, as a function of temperature, yes, but what I'm talking about is the density of air. Yeah, well, it's trivial to calculate. You know how to do it. <laughs> um, um, let's go to the other limit. Let's suppose we have saturated air, but let's suppose the air is minus 40 degrees C. Well, that air is saturated, but it contains almost no moisture because uh, very cold air can only contain a tiny bit of moisture. So if you cool it down some more, almost no moisture condenses out, and so it's almost the same as being dry. So in the limit of uh, low temperatures, then, the... Uh, the moist lapse rate is almost the same as the unsaturated rate, namely three degrees per thousand feet. So this process is typically not reversible because suppose I take my little baggy, my saran wrap uh, full of um, air up in my airplane and I lift it up a thousand feet and it was moist, so the moisture condenses out. And let's suppose I let that water drain away and then I bring it back down again. Well that moisture is not available to be uh, reabsorbed, and so uh, the, um, uh, the temperature will cha change as if it's dry air because I'm not reabsorbing moisture. So this process where we're um, allowing moisture condense is technically not called an adiabatic process. It's referred to as a pseudo-adiabatic process. Pseudo, pseudo because um, of the... Slight. So what I've just described is actually responsible for what are called uh, Santa Ana conditions here in uh, California, or in the Rockies they call them Chinooks, in Europe they call them ferns. And um, they arise from this uh, irreversibility of, uh, of condensation and uh, recompression. So let's suppose on the um, left side of the mountains here we have some uh, mo moist air that's at uh, 20 degrees Celsius, let's say. And the winds are from the left to right. So the air gets lifted as it goes up the mountain range. And let's suppose that the, that um, air becomes saturated when we get to 5,000 feet. 
So if you remember your numbers then, if we go 5,000 feet, we're lifting unsaturated air, so it'll cool by how much? 3 degrees per thousand, so 15 degrees. So if it starts off at 20, it'll cool down to? Looks like 5. Looks like 5. <laughs> <laughs> Helping you out with the math. So 5 degrees C. Now we lifted another uh, 4,000 feet, but now it's saturated air. And that saturated air cools slowly and will Pick a typical number between one and three, let's call it two. And so it'll cool um, two degrees per thousand feet. And so uh, 4,000 feet times two degrees per thousand, eight degrees. So coming over the top of the mountain, the air will be minus three. Well, that moisture got condensed out, and we got all this rainfall on the windward side of the mountains there. And then the air descends down the back, so down the lee side of the mountains. and it will um, recompress as it goes down, and therefore it will warm up. But now it's dry air, because it doesn't have the moisture that it just got rid of on the other side. And so it will warm up at the dry rate, which was 3 degrees per thousand feet, 9,000 feet, 27 degrees. So we end up at 24 degrees C. So the air that was 20 degrees C on the windward side of the mountains is 24 degrees C, much warmer on the, um, uh, on the downwind side. So those uh, warm, dry winds that you get uh, when we have these offshore conditions coming off the uh, mountains, coming down towards us, the reason it's warmer and drier is this process here. So this is all about lapse rates then. Uh, lapse rate, by definition, is the rate of decrease of some temperature with altitude. Now, there's one other one you've learned, but maybe have forgotten since, which is the uh, so-called standard lapse rate, which is 2 degrees Celsius per 1,000 feet. And this is the one that's uh, assumed in performance charts for your airplane. So it's a sort of reference condition. But it's totally irrelevant for weather because... Um, only on a miraculous day would the actual lapse rate be 2 degrees per thousand feet. It varies all over the map. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. Uh, only if you had absolutely no knowledge whatsoever would you use this as a guess. But doesn't that come from the fact that if you average over the whole globe, that's what you get? Well, I think it's averaging over, sort of over North America, roughly. It's supposed to be that. Because it's the U.S. standard atmosphere as opposed to, you know, some world standard. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's some sort of average, and it's a nice convenient thing. I mean, it, if you actually average, it isn't a, you know, a, a smooth gradient, but it kind of has got wobbles in it and stuff, and you don't want that in a standard. So it's just some convenient thing to choose that's somehow typical, but not, uh, not what you get on any given day. Um, so we can forget about that as far as the weather is concerned. Then there's what's referred to as the ambient or the environmental lapse rate, and that refers to the actual temperature. And that's uh, what you go out and measure um, by balloon launch, uh, where they send these balloons off twice a day and they measure the temperatures and <coughs> to limit them down to the ground. Or you could go up in your airplane and watch the outside air temperatures you go up. Or, um, may, or for the future, will be forecast by some uh, numerical model. And then what we've just discussed are the adiabatic and pseudo-adiabatic lapse rates, which describe the rate at which a um, uh, I don't know where that air came from a, a rate at which a parcel cools on lifting. The three degrees Celsius per thousand feet for dry air, meaning unsaturated, and somewhere between one and three for moist air. Air parcel, that's what it's supposed to be. Yeah. So as I mentioned, temperature soundings are made by balloon um, at zero Zulu and 18 Zulu at um, hundreds of stations around the world, measuring, among other things, these environmental lapse rates. So instability results then if the ambient lapse rate exceeds the adiabatic lapse rate, that is, the temperature cools more rapidly than altitude than the parcel would if you lifted it. So there's actually three situations. At a given altitude, the atmosphere is either stable, unstable, or in between, which is called conditionally unstable. 
So unstable means that the ambient lapse rate, as the slope of the actual temperature with altitude, is less steep than 3 degrees Celsius per thousand feet. Sorry, it's unstable if you're over here. If the actual lapse rate is more steep than 3 degrees per thousand feet, it's for sure stable if the temperature falls off more slowly than uh, the moist adiabatic lapse rate, or if it increases with altitude, if the temperature increases with altitude, that's called well, the temperature inversion, it's guaranteed to be stable. But then there's this in-between in condition where it's either stable or unstable depending on its moisture content. If it was saturated, it would be unstable. If it's uh, dry, it's not. And the interesting st stuff happens with weather where you have air that's almost saturated, and you lift a little bit, suddenly it becomes saturated, and now it was stable, and now it's no longer stable. And so that's what's called conditionally unstable. Lift it a bit, and then uh, give it a, a head start on going up. Then it'll keep on going up. The situation of the air being, uh, uh, of dry air being unstable is actually an unusual one. Um, Typically, uh, only happens near the surface uh, in the desert in summertime. And that's because uh, the convection that occurs because of the instability carries heat up from the surface, which uh, tends to flatten out the lapse rate and get rid of the instability you had in the first place. So you have this very hot ground because the sun's blasting down on it. It heats the air next to the ground. You've got this rapid fall off of temperature, but then this hot air rises, it mixes with the cooler air above, and warms it up, and brings it back to stability again. Okay, so next uh, month, what we're going to be discussing in great detail is this uh, skew-t diagram. And it's used to uh, plot this information, the temperature versus altitude, uh, not only the temperature, but also the dew point, and other information winds on a, um, a chart that's a sort of fancy graph paper that um, was designed to uh, do meteorological calculations. Um, so on this particular chart, here's the website. Um, the red line is the temperature. The blue line is the uh, dew point. This is actually for Livermore sometime last year. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, could you el eliminate the difference between the red line and the blue line as far as what is dew point versus temperature? Oh, sure. So temperature is what you uh, measure with a thermometer. So temperature in this room is, you know, whatever it is, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. The dew point is the temperature to which you'd have to cool a parcel of air from this room to make moisture condense. So... Um, if the temperature is 70 and the dew point 70, then it means that the air is what? Totally saturated, right? If I cool it any, moisture will condense. So, and if the temperature and dew point are close together, then it means you only need a little bit of cooling and the moisture will condense. So that's the, uh, why one has this um, private pilot ground school thing, that if the temperature and the dew point spread get close together, less than about 4 degrees, then you'd expect low IFR weather, either the ceilings would be low or the visibility would be low because of the high humidity of the ambient. So we'll be looking in great detail at this chart. I just want to give you a little pre preview of it. And so it has on the chart the, uh, the, uh, the dry adiabats, that is the rate at which you took a parcel and it was dry, you would climb up one of these curves, moist adiabats, mixing ratio, temperature, pressures. Uh, fascinating stuff, which we'll get to. But first we need to motivate you as to why you'd want to learn all this stuff. So why do we care whether the weather is stable or unstable? Stable and unstable air are associated with distinct uh, weather patterns. So I've got them in two, two columns here. Stable on the left, unstable on the right. So the fundamental characteristic of unstable air is that if you lift it, it keeps on going up. And so because of that, um, you're constantly launching off updrafts where the air is going up and somewhere else to compensate the air is to come down. So all over the place then you've got updrafts one place, down 
downdrafts another, convection currents, vertical mixing of the air. And so the airflow, rather than being uh, laminar, that is running along essentially parallel to the surface in straight lines, if it's unstable, it's wobbling up and down depending on whether you're in an updraft or a downdraft, that particular location in space. So stable, you have this laminar airflow, unstable up and down drafts. And so if you go flying, the first thing you'll notice that uh, if it's stable, the flying uh, is normally fairly smooth. Conversely, uh, on an unstable day, as you go through these up and down drafts, that will bump the airplane around. The surface manifestation of this, if it's windy, is that on the ground, if it's stable, the surface winds will tend to be fairly steady. On the other hand, if it's up and down drafts, then the, um, uh, the surface winds will be uh, gusty depending on whether you, you're locally sitting right over an updraft, right over a downdraft, or on the edge, you know, depending <coughs> where that is relative to the, to the airport. next big difference is the kind of clouds that form. On a stable day, since the um, air has no uh, tendency to, if you push it up, it comes back down again, the clouds that form tend to form in flat sheets. And those kind of clouds are called the stratus clouds. Whereas on an unstable day, where the air is rising, it cools, and where it cools the dew point, cloud forms. So sitting on the tops of the updrafts, you've got clouds. And in between where the air is descending, you have no clouds. And so these clouds that are in clumps all over the place, kind of puffy white things, those are called cumulus type clouds. If it's stable, the visibilities have a tendency to be poor because if there's any um, uh, smoke in the atmosphere, for instance, any pollution that's been piling up, then there's no updrafts to carry them up into the upper atmosphere and get rid of it. And so this stuff just accumulates. And uh, the visibilities tend to drop, and those uh, um, dust particles and car exhaust and whatever also attract moisture, which can dense on it and generally bring the visibility down. Conversely, when it's unstable, then except in the clouds and uh, precipitation, if there is any, the visibility tends to be good because the updraft is constantly mixing in fresh air from uh, at high altitudes where the air is nice and clear. If you get precipitation, then the kind of precipitation you get from the stratus type clouds is steady precipitation. Because remember, these clouds just exist in long, flat, horizontal sheets, and they're all pretty much the same over here as they are there. So it's raining here, it's raining there. As you fly along, you stay in the stay in the same position relative to those clouds, the rain is fairly steady. Whereas if you go flying around, just took a straight line across a day when you've got uh, cumulus clouds dropping, dropping rain, then depending on whether you're under that cumulus cloud or not, you're either in a shower, rain shower or you're not in a rain shower. So it's uh, showery precipitation. If you get icing, the kind of uh, ice that you're liable to get is uh, somewhat different on a stable day than an unstable day. Uh, if you're flying at a level where you're getting icing on a stable day, then you'll probably keep on getting it because the conditions uh, exist over a large lateral dimension. So if you manage to pick the altitude, which is bad, it's going to stay bad. And so you'll get continuous icing. Um, however, because the droplets in stratus clouds are smaller than the ones that can be supported by big updrafts, the rate of accumulation isn't normally that high. And so you've got continuous icing, but it's typically light to moderate, and it only become a problem if you just allow it to, uh, to continue accumulating for long periods. And also, the layer in which icing exists tends to be fairly limited vertically, typically about 4,000 feet or so. so Climbing, you know, more than 4,000 feet from where you are in a stratus type condition is used, would normally be enough to get you out of those conditions. Now, all, everything we've just said is totally the opposite if you're flying on an unstable day, as far as ice is concerned. First of all, 
the icing will be intermittent because if you're in the downdraft parts, you're not supporting any moisture and no ice, and then you fly into this cumulus where the air is rising and it's bringing up all this moisture from below, and splat, you got a bunch of ice. And uh, those droplets can be larger in a, in a cumulus cloud than a stratus cloud, so those droplets, when they freeze, tend to freeze more slowly, and so you have more of a tendency to get clear-type icing than you do in a, uh, a stratus cloud. So you get possibly heavy clear icing, and also uh, climbing, you're going to have to climb a lot higher to get out of it, because where the icing is in these cumulus clouds, there's convection currents carrying this moisture up from below, and it'll carry up to quite high altitudes and to colder temperatures than in the stratus situation. Can you define ICIP for me? Yeah. Icing in clouds and in precipitation. Straight off the area forecaster. Um, so the main hazards then, as far as stable, condi stable conditions are, um, you've got a good possibility of low ceilings and visibilities. Um, low IFR weather can occur when it's stable. When it's unstable, it's unlikely to be low IFR, but you have uh, the potential for thunderstorms, which are, of course, hazardous. And then in either conditions, you have the possibility of icing. So after these unrelenting word slides, very few pictures. Uh, so here are some stratus clouds on the left. Then we're looking at a stratus deck from above and from below. Um, and uh, technically, stratus cloud, a stri just a plain ordinary stratus cloud, is a stratus cloud that's at low altitude. They give them, uh, they put a prefix on them. If they're higher, they're called alto stratus. If they're at the melted middle altitudes, and cirro stratus. If they're up way beyond the surface ceilings of our airplanes. If they produce uh, rain, then they get to be called nimbostratus because nimbus is the, uh, is the Latin word for rain. So the opposite situation then are your cumulus-type clouds. The cumulus -type clouds form an unstable air. So we have a cumulus buildup in the top left there. Um, we have a cumulus cloud looking black and glowering at night with lightning coming out the bottom. Uh, lumpy looking formation on the right. Uh, but cumulus clouds aren't necessarily bad. The, um, they uh, become hazardous if they grow to high altitudes, and that doesn't always happen. We'll be discussing the situations under which it will or won't. And so so-called fair weather cumulus, uh, uh, cumulus clouds that top out at relatively low altitudes, and um, dodge your way around them, and it's a perfectly nice day to fly, maybe a little bumpy. So if you look at a, a weather report, with a few exceptions, you're not going to find out what kind of cloud it is. On, we'd look at a METAR, it says, you know, 3,000 overcast, whatever. It doesn't say whether it's cumulus or status. Um, but um, uh, sometimes uh, just by looking at a satellite picture, you can tell uh, what kind of cloud you got. So up in the top left corner there, um, there's an, an Aleutian low. This uh, bulge here, there's a cold front here, and behind it, we've got the cold air of the of cold Arctic air mass moving down here over the Pacific. Um, so this cold air is coming over a relatively warm ocean, and that's an unstable situation. You're heating the uh, air from below, and so you'll get cumulus type clouds. So you have the rather obvious cumulus here. Here, where the front itself is coming, you've got this mass of Arctic air shoving underneath the, uh, the warmer air from the, um, uh, the middle latitudes, and there that lifting is pushing those clouds to much high altitudes. So uh, a big cloud band here. And over here, we've got the cloud band of the associated warm front. Uh, if you look over here, over the um, upper Midwest, then uh, you can see, instead of being this kind of pockmarked appearance of the cumulus clouds, uh, it's a sort of a steady gray, and that's a uh, uh, stratus deck. It's actually hard to tell just from a visible I image um, whether that's a stratus deck, maybe something down fairly low, or maybe it was, you know, cirrus up high. Um, 
to determine that, you'd have to look at an infrared uh, satellite image because an infrared image tells you the cloud temperatures. And so if you see a nice, smooth, continuous cloud deck that is relatively warm at a temperature that's comparable to that of the ground, then you know it's down low. On the other hand, if it's a, a real cold cloud deck, then you know it's up high. Uh, another thing that in the winter you have to watch for is you look at this thing and you might say, oh, look, it's cloudy over the Sierras. No, there's actually no clouds there at all. But it's hard to tell just by looking at the picture. The way I would tell is I'd run a time loop, and I would discover that these clouds do not move, whereas all these other ones do. So it's cumulo granite or cumulo snow. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's actually snow. And so you have to be able to distinguish snow cover from... Um, the snow cover too. I have to distinguish snow cover from clouds. So the easiest way to do that is from motion. Or if you get a real high resolution picture, then um, the snow, yeah, you can't quite see, see the skiers or read their license plates or anything, but you can, it has a, um, uh, a sort of um, feathery kind of appearance compared to clouds. But wouldn't, if you have winds going over a mountain range, wouldn't you expect clouds to be just... Oh, yeah. So, I mean, they could have been clouds. They're just not. Oh, I see. If those were stationary. they wouldn't move because... Yeah, well... As the orographic lifting forms cloud, it drops rain, and then on the wind leeward side, the clouds don't exist because there's no more moisture, so those clouds deck would stay parked in the west. Yeah, but I think they can... I think you'd see a little bit of motion. I mean, the, the, these things, are, okay, you know, so picture to picture, there's no change at all. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so we said before that if the air's stable, it's... It's smooth. Well, it isn't absolutely guaranteed um, because if the air is stable, it's actually capable of supporting wind shears because, you know, we've got air moving along at some speed here, air moving along at some speed there. Because vertical motion is suppressed because the air is stable, those, those air masses don't mix, and so you can have uh, different wind speeds at different altitudes. So you can only get a wind shear if it's stable. But um, if you have a very strong wind shear, and you, then uh, you can generate uh, turbulence, basically, at the interface between the, uh, the, the two airspeeds. And if, if you've you know, made instrument approaches and so forth through a wind shear, then you'll know you go down, boom, 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 boom. The needles disappear off the side of the instrument. And then, <laughs> then you go down below because there's big wind, wind shift and so forth as you drop down below, and the signal that everything is about to go to hell on the approach is the, uh, it was beautifully smooth, and now it's turbulent, it's smooth again. So this is, um, uh, so these, uh, so we've, it just so happens that the stationary air below is nice and moist, and so it's got these clouds in it, and then the rapidly moving air coming across from left to right is sweeping across the top of this and, uh, and causing an instability at the interface, which you can actually see. And the physicist in Hill recognize this as the Kelvin-Helmholtz instability. There's another occasion when you'll have stable air and it isn't uh, necessarily smooth, and that's when you have a mountain wave. A mountain wave is where you have a, a layer of at least a layer of stable air over the mountains and strong winds blowing perpendicular to the ridge lines. The air gets lifted by the mountains, pushes up against the stable air, which pushes back. It uh, doesn't want to be lifted. It wants to come back down again. So it comes down and bounces a few times downwind of the, um, uh, the mountain range. So on the leeward side, then, the air is going up and down. And... Uh, Within that sort of sinusoidal motion, it's actually quite smooth, but you can get uh, underneath it uh, rotor clouds, and if there's a big wind shear, then it, it can be like uh, breaking waves at the ocean where the tops go faster than the bottoms, and if those mountain waves break, then you'll get very severe turbulence within it. How big these uh, cumulus-type clouds grow depends on the depth of the unstable layer. If you have a relatively shallow layer of unstable air, then uh, you can trigger some lifting, 
snakes and clouds, but the clouds can't build very high because they hit uh, a stable ceiling. Another thing you learnt um, in your ground school but have maybe forgotten is that uh, in this kind of situation where what we have is um, warm moist air rising, forming a uh, clouds at a base here, you can calculate the bases of those clouds from the temperature dew point spread at the surface because it takes a certain amount of cooling to make a cloud and the bigger the temperature dew point difference is, the more cooling you need to do, the higher you need to lift it. And so the rule of thumb is you divide the surface temperature dew point spread in Fahrenheit by the magic number 4.4 .4, and that gives you the height of the clouds in thousands of feet. So that's another source of the um, um, rule of thumb that if the temperature dew point spread drops below 4 degrees you've got a good chance of IFR weather because if you form these kinds of clouds they'd form below 1,000 feet. If we have a deep unstable layer of air then we have the potential for thunderstorms. So let me remind you then thunderstorms uh, require three ingredients. We need a deep layer of conditionally unstable air so we have cumulus type clouds that can build into cumulonimbus by uh, lifting. The more moisture the better because the, uh, it's the latent heat of condensation of the rising air that's uh, condensing out that provides the energy that powers the storm. And lastly, we need some lifting action because if the air is only conditionally unstable, somehow we have to get it started. So we have to lift it up enough that it becomes saturated so we can keep on going. And so that lifting mechanism depends on the uh, situation uh, and they give them different names. So um, so-called air mass thunderstorms happen when uh, the thunderstorms essentially occur random inside some air mass and they're randomly triggered by uh, something as silly as, well, you've got a big parking lot here and that parking lot gets relatively hot in the sun and so it produces a rising bubble of air and that triggers off a local thunderstorm. But this is not organized in any kind of pattern. Get one here, get one there. Those are called air mass. Then we have the, th the frontal storms. The frontal storms are where you have, for instance, a cold front, a wedge of cold air moving in, lifting the air above it. And as it gets lifted up the surface here, if it's conditionally unstable, there's a point where you've lifted it enough that it becomes, un becomes saturated and therefore unstable. And once it's unstable, it says, okay, here we go, and keeps on climbing up. Um, squall lines typically form a few hundred miles ahead of uh, rapidly moving cold fronts. And then you have your orographic uh, thunderstorms. Uh, orographic is caused by what? Terrain. Lifting over terrain. So the things you get in the Sierras in the summer, those thunderstorms you get there, which you didn't have in the Central Valley, those are orographically generated. So to summarize then, um, Atmospheric stability is determined by comparing the uh, ambient lapse rate, that's the actual rate at which the temperature decreases at altitude, with the appropriate uh, adiabatic lapse rate. If uh, you determine the air is stable, then you'd expect it to be smooth, steady winds, stratus type clouds, steady precipitation, if any, poor visibilities, rime icing. Conversely, if it's unstable, uh, you'd expect to see uh, bumpy air, gusty winds, cumulus-type clouds, showery precipitation, good visibilities, uh, clear icing perhaps. Uh, skew T-charts plot uh, temperature dew point soundings and next month we'll learn how to use these to extract uh, useful information about uh, estimating uh, cloud layers and tops, potential for icing, potential for thunderstorms, fog, turbulence, mountain waves. Thank you.